and welcome to today's episode of Global Photographies Forum. Now today's guest is somebody who actually literally lives on top of the world. Today's guest is Cecilia Blomdahl. Now she lives in a cabin in Svalbard. Now I'll let her do the introduction and tell you where that is. She has been living in this beautiful landscape for the past four and a half years. Hi Cecilia, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having How me. Are you? I'm good, very I've good. Got, got to mention you are also a fellow F-stop uh, champion and a fantastic photographer, no, no doubt. So the guys are probably wondering by what I meant uh, uh, by yourself living on top of the world, which you literally are. Can you yeah. just tell us what that means exactly? Well, so Svalbard is a group of islands. It's actually Svalbard and Jan Mayen. And the island that we live on is called Svalbard. So it's Spitsbergen. And on this island, we have one town called Longyearbyen, which is governed by Norway, and this is where I live. So we oh, are so about 1,050 kilometers away from the North Pole. So very close. <laughs> that is very close. So your higher, so just get in perspective, a lot of people will obviously know where Iceland is. Um, you're, you're further than Iceland, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. If you have Greenland, about at like almost at the top, then you have Svalbard, almost at the top of Greenland. So I'm not going to try to say any of the words that you just said now because I'm going to probably get them all wrong. Um, <laughs> how does it feel living up there? I mean, you've been there for about four and a half years. Tell us about where the decision came from or... It's just, it's an amazing place. It's very special. So I think you need to be kind of a, a certain type of person to live here. We're only about 2,400 people living here. So it's a very small little town. But it offers you so much of nature that I think that's what draws people in here. Like when I came up, a lot of people come up and they say that they're going to stay here for a couple of months. I bet you if you ask anybody, they're going to say, oh, I was only supposed to be here for three months. And the same was with me. I was supposed to be here for three months. <laughs> and then after, you know, the months just go on and then you're still here because you just can't leave because it's it's amazing. It's the special yeah. place. So four and a half years later, I'm still here. <laughs> Four and a half years. I can, I can, I think I can relate to that way. You're saying you were there. For, you went. You meant to go for three and a half, three months or something, and then you ended up going for four and a half years. This is uh, wow. If we just have a look at your website, I mean, look at some of your images. We we'll probably yeah. understand why that probably is. Yeah. Um, of this. Yeah. So this is your homepage just there. Look, wow, that landscape is phenomenal. So is this close by to where you are? Not really. To get around the island in the wintertime, we can only travel by snowmobile. And in the summertime, we can only go by boat. So we only have about one road that kind of leads through the village. And anything outside the village, you need like a snowmobile or boat. So this is the winter shots. We've driven maybe like five hours with a snowmobile to get there. And then you have to drive home again <laughs> or stay in a cabin. So it's well, very, phenomenal. it's very different. Unreal, absolutely yeah, unreal. Yeah. I'm this sorry, I'm just going to have to take them on because it's like, um, yeah, it's one of my favorites. There, the yeah. village is just phenomenal. Do you have, have you ever witnessed, I mean, well, I think they are collapsing there. Is that, have you caught anything there? Uh, no, this is in the winter, so it doesn't move that right. much. But in the summer, you need to be aware so you don't go too close. There's always a limit. Ah. I think it's a 300 meters because uh, they do calve. What's called calve. Oh, ah, yeah. okay. The yeah, sound, so, the crackling noise and the stuff that yeah, you hear. You and, and you can just not? hear a crack and then you'll see it fall into the ocean. That's also one of my this favorite awesome. places. Yeah. That's uh, when we go on a cabin trip as well. We uh, go to places like this. And this is in northern Norway, though. That's Svalbard. Ah, okay. That's northern Norway. Lofoten. Oh, Here yeah. we have the polar That's bears. <laughs> Population. Oh, is that what? Yeah, there they are. Bears. They came, we were staying in a cabin because on the weekends here, we have a couple of different cabins scattered across the island. So we can kind of rent them for a weekend. So we went right. to one at Cap Schultz, it's called. And suddenly we were just sitting inside. We looked outside our window and literally one meter outside the window we have these two polar bear kind of cubs just staring and they were actually climbing on our snowmobiles 
and they have a tendency to bite and ruin anything. So we had to open the window and just go, no, <laughs> yeah, go yeah, yeah. Just, just They were scared. Just for, like, for their own safety and the safety of the things around you. Yeah. So when you initially came here, um, like you said, you fell in love with the place, obviously, almost instantly. How, yeah. you know, with, it being, with the population being so small, how did you manage to get about and find work and survive really how yeah how so one about? important thing about Svalbard is that you should have a job before you move here it's it's kind of like you're not supported by the society up here if you don't have a job so there's not going to be any what, what do you call it welfare or any society like helping you you need to have a job and you need to be able to pay for yourself but that's why we don't also have we don't have that many old people because we don't have anything that supports them so when you get here you do need to have a job which i had when i moved up uh, you also need to have an apartment before because we don't have that many apartments. So, but after that, I mean, I thought I was going to think that it was smaller. I thought that I was going to feel that it was smaller. But mm. It's kind of like a big city with the pulse of all the tourists coming in, but then it is very tiny. But it, you don't feel it that much. How is tourism in India? Is, 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 is it known for tourism? Do you get tourists like you do in Iceland, for example, or Norway? Definitely. So now during the corona, of course, we have been on lockdown. We haven't had a single visitor in like three months. But otherwise, this is right now mainly making money from tourism. Before it was from the coal mining. And that's why this like town is here, because they just mine coal. But now uh -huh. it's mostly from tourism. So it's very important for us up here that we have people that come visiting. And I'd say the busiest season is our winter season, and our winter is not normal winter. Our winter is February to May. That's when we have our sunny winter. So we have minus 30 degrees, sunshine, bunch of snow, and you go on snowmobiles and you explore. <laughs> wow, that was going to segue me into the next question was, are you constantly living on like ice all the time or does it ever clear? Our ground is permanently frozen. So in the ground, it's always going to be frozen all year round. But in the winter, you will have mostly snow and ice. But then during the summer months, which is now, we have like tundra. So it doesn't really grow anything, but there's a sort of kind of orangey grass. So the ground is orange. It's not green. In some places, it can be a little bit green, but we don't have that much grass or we have no trees, no, like no bushes, nothing grows. So That's obviously just, because of the cold and not enough sun. Or, well, you do get sun, but it's not the same. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the permanently frozen ground. You can't really, nothing really grows there. So originally you're from, is it Sweden? Yeah, Gothenburg. And Sweden does have a good variety of trees, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> we do. How, how, how did you feel the difference? I mean, when I came out here to Dubai and things were different where there are trees, but it's not the same as uh, as you get, you know, you get back in the UK where there's forest land and stuff like that. So it's not the same. And plus, with it all being man-made, it does have that impact. How did you, I mean, yours isn't man-made, that's what yours is the way it is because of nature. How did it have an impact on you when, you know, you went out and all you saw was just vast sheets of ice for as far yeah. as I can see? How does that actually feel? Does it I think have an impact on you? Yeah, but since it's so extreme, you kind of love the beauty of what this is. Like outside my house, I have about six different glaciers that I can see from my house. So like you kind of just move your focus from, okay, we don't have trees, but I have six glaciers outside my house that I can watch. <laughs> so like, I don't feel like I'm missing something. <laughs> I can go home I and see, yeah. I love trees, but up here, we, it's just different. So you enjoy all of the different things. Yeah. So some really making use of what's saying you know, like negative spaces is nothing but there's something for you to enjoy really, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. Like we might not have trees, but we have so much other amazing nature. But I do you... love coming home and just smelling grass, you know, that kind of tree smell. We don't You really talked about it being very, very cold. How yeah. is your temperature let's let's just talk about today for example. Yeah. How is it for you today? You said it's summer. So summer's kicking in slowly. Yeah. It snowed about three days ago. <laughs> so we had a snowstorm in June. But uh, today it's six degrees, which is like a good day. <laughs> it's like, okay, yay. But I mean, it's between zero to about 10 degrees during summer. Last year, I think we had two days with like 15 degrees. It was shocking. I went sunbathing, of course. But, <laughs> you know, you just, it's a, a cold summer. The sun is always up. 
does that extreme change all of a sudden where you know you get the, 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 the temperature fluctuation it just happens overnight literally the rule about Svalbard which we tell everybody moves there like here the weather is going to change within one hour and it's going to go from one extreme to the next so whenever you're going out on a trip whether it's yeah. snowmobile or hiking you need to bring everything you can imagine for every weather so I remember we had just now when it was winter we had one day where it went from zero degrees to minus 25 within 10 hours i mean that's quite a lot in just like one day so it, it just it went from i don't know it's just crazy so you need to be well prepared because um a storm can roll in in 20 minutes it can start yeah. snowing in five and it can go out in those environments it's nasty there's absolutely yeah. nothing which you can really do because I know, um, I don't know if you've ever been stuck in a blizzard. I haven't myself, obviously, in a snow blizzard where you just cannot see anything. Why I'm just referring to this from, you have. Yes. Have you ever Remember. been? Oh, wow. That must be really frightening. It's insane, to be honest, because when you get caught, like it's mostly when we're out uh, driving our snowmobiles, it is very common to get caught up in a whiteout. So we all have GPSs on our snowmobiles. But I remember this one time where I've never felt so disoriented because I, mm. could, I didn't know anything of what was around me. I didn't know if I was mm. going down something or if I was, and I just had to keep my eyes focused on the person in front of me. And I could only see this much of his helmet. And he was about 10 meters away from me. And I just tried to stay focused because we had to, we were trying to go home. We failed though. We drove for three hours in a wide out to have to turn around and drive back to the cabin. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, we couldn't go to work. We had to just send uh, from our satellite phones that we're stuck. We can't go to work. But it How was long that, thing. How long did that last for until it was all clear and you were OK? Uh, we could leave the next day in the morning. <laughs> ah, so, so it just gets changed be, overnight. Yeah, it can be days or it can be just hours. But it's a crazy feeling to be stuck. And also when you know that you're outside, you only have your clothes, you only have your snowmobile, and you're hmm. in the middle of nowhere. You're hours hmm. away from civilization. But it's also a cool feeling because you know you have to just stick it out. You have to be smart as well. You can't just... You have to, you have to yeah. do it to survive. Exactly. You just have to get home or go back to the cabin. And that's why it's very important, what I feel, when you go on a trip up here, you need to choose the people you go with. <laughs> or be yeah, very, I mean, very wary of your own possibilities, like what you're able to do. I because... mean, I'm getting the sense of uh, you love this you love this adventure and this thrill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Adrenaline really just instead of i mean like i said i would be scared in those environments obviously because it's it is very frightening you're not you know yeah. you get disinterred dis in i'm not gonna say the word. yeah yeah <laughs> that's what happens um and you're not quite sure where you are and you can get lost in, in that kind of sense i'm not showing how it's going to be so you know well, well done to you for doing that but because yeah. we've had friends who've gotten stuck in whiteouts had to dig themselves into like a i don't know what the english word is for it but where you just make a like a like a hole <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, like a, like a KFC thing. Yeah, yeah, what's it called in English? I don't know. But where they've actually had to call the Susanman, which is our government, who had to come and rescue them with a helicopter. And they were oh. many kilometers away from this like village and they couldn't get home. <laughs> so it, wow. yeah, you need to be. There's no prepared. mercy for anybody who loses. Uh, that's extreme. So are these kind of, do this, does this happen mainly in the winter time when it's more likely to happen? I'm going to guess. Yeah. We need snow. I mean, it, mostly happens when we have a lot of snow in the summer mm. we're going to have different kind of weather it's going to be very stormy but you don't have the snow so you have a different kind of visibility mm. but yeah so it's mostly not... in the snow time i still can't uh, fathom how you're saying it's summer but it's still full of snow it's just so it's just so bizarre to just kind of like put the two together so you know you're talking maximum you've reached in summer is about 16 average about 10 to 6 so what's it like in the winter um, I'd say average about minus, it kind of depends when, because our winter we have, okay, I'll start over. We have a polar night, which is when we have 24 hour seven darkness. And that starts in November. So the sun right, yeah. sets for three months or like two and a half. So that's kind of when winter starts, but we don't necessarily have snow at that time. It kind of depends on the weather, obviously. And at that so, time, it's going to be maybe minus five degrees. We we literally mean where the sun goes below the horizon. Yeah, and it never right? comes so back. So it doesn't come back up for a couple of months, right? Yeah, two okay. and a half months. For two and, and a half months, you get no sunlight. None. Does it? Does it? 
Does it get? Do you, do you get any light from anywhere? Is it or does it just look like it's nighttime all the time? Nighttime. Literally, is it dark? Dark, pitch black. It's the best time of year. I love the polar nights so much. Is that when your aurora season might be the best? Because you do get the aurora there as well. Yeah, it's going to be kind of our only season because we can't see it, like when the sun is up. So we have the most epic season. And I think a lot of people think that this is the hardest for us up here. I know that a lot of journalists have come up here and they've asked people about the polar night, like kind of expecting to have these answers about it being horrible. And all of us are just kind of like, it's amazing. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> just says how amazing it is because it's so calm and quiet. And like the whole village kind of turns everything down a notch. Mm. Everything is just moving at slow speed, like uh, slow speed, and it's beautiful. And you have the aurora like all day, and it's incredible. I know you've got a uh, is it a husky or it's a, a wolf Finnish lapon. Yeah, right. it's a Finnish lapon, and I stole it from my friend. So somebody else actually owns him, but he lives with me because we oh, have a okay. <laughs> yeah. How how old is he? Uh, five. Right. So yeah, have you had him since he was a pup, or? Yeah, well, so I, my friend actually owns him. He has a brother as well. But me and him have the weirdest connection. We just love each other. And she just feels like, I mean, we're neighbors. So he just lives with me. And we're very happy together. Wow. I know so it's I've beautiful. Had... I've seen so many uh, so many uh, snaps of him, you know, what you put up on Instagram when I follow your stories. Guys, if you really want to know what I'm talking about, you really have to uh, follow Cecilia's story to find out. There was once where uh, a couple of days ago, maybe last week, you, he was outside and you were asking him to come inside. And <laughs> yeah. I loved how you were communi communicating with him. It seemed like you were speaking in, in your native language as well. Yeah. He seemed to understand, but you're also putting a bit of English in there as well. And yeah. he just wouldn't want to come inside. No, he and I'm gonna, I don't know if this was a confusion because I know at this time, you know, you mentioned earlier in the winter, the sun goes below the horizon. But right now we've got it where the sun is above the horizon, day and night. Exactly. So we have 24 hour sun. We have the midnight sun and it never sets. It's going to set again in August. So it is daylight all the time. So right now it is 12 p.m. So 12 in the middle of the day. And this is what it looks like. It's quite overcast right now, but as you can see, it's full on daylight. It's 12 p.m. So it's midnight. And the sun is shining. How crazy is that? Crazy. So it's 12 p.m. and the sun is shining here on Svalbard. So this is the midnight sun. Crazy, right? <laughs> um. I mean, we talked about your your winter and how how cold it really does get. Have you done the hot water challenge thing? You know where people you see on on, on YouTube and stuff where you get hot water and you fling and it yeah. instantly freezes. Does it actually really instantly freeze? It does happen. It's pretty crazy. So if you walk out and it's about say minus twenty and you throw boiling water, it's gonna go. But it's wow. crazy if you also go outside and you go on a walk in maybe minus thirty you'll notice within like a minute that your eyelashes have frozen. And every piece of hair that has some damp kind of water on it has just frozen. And you can just see it progress. I went on one walk where I took a photo or like a little video after just a couple of minutes and you could just see a building. Just capture the moment. I mean, yeah. you just told me now after a couple of minutes getting out of the house, I don't know how you do it. I mean, here it's really hot now. You know, we're talking, you know, 30, 40 degrees and just going to the shop to get groceries. I mean, we have deliveries as well, but sometimes I like to take the kids out for a little bit of a walk. It yeah. gets really hot and you're sweating. <laughs> you know, within five minutes you're sweating. Yeah, um, but I think it's so it's, much more easier when it's cold, you can always put more clothes on. on. That's why That's I, I really you. prefer the cold versus the heat because the heat you can't get rid of. There's but only so much you can take off until it becomes yeah. illegal. <laughs> but I can tell you, you you never have enough layers here. <laughs> so just pile I, on. <laughs> before we actually moved here to Dubai, we, to Dubai, we were actually going to move over to Iceland. I was oh. uh, looking for opportunities over there because I myself, I'm a cold person. I do prefer the cold. Um, oh, okay. And I do a lot of camping in Scotland because that's as cold as it can be. And I love that kind of that kind of environment. I haven't actually been to Iceland myself. My trip got cancelled. But at oh. the time, 
I didn't know about, you know, um, the place where you are, uh, mm. and about Svalbard, but obviously, hopefully, a lot of people will know more about it now. Yeah. I'm not saying the floodgates of tourism will open up after this video, but it'd be amazing if they did. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have open for Norway now. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. No, does Norway own a bit of uh, the island? Is it independent? Are it you is. There's a Svalbard Treaty, which is an agreement with it, like, okay, I have to Google it, but there's an agreement of a couple of countries, like 40 countries, that say that you can come and work here and live here without having a visa. So it's a visa-free zone for all of these countries from Svalbard Treaty, which they made long, many years ago. As long as you can pay the bills, you know, right? Exactly, in. yeah. And you're allowed to start a company here, and they've made it very open. But Norway is governed. This is nor governed by Norway. So we have Norwegian laws that uh, are specified for Svalbard, and we have a Norwegian governor and Sussel, no, not governor, but Sysselmannen, which is our police. Wow. Oh. So that's, yeah. But we've had an issue now where we haven't been able to leave the island because they closed the island for everybody, uh, even for Norway, which is weird because we are Norway. So we've had to, you know, watch. Again, this will be down to borders closing because of the because uh, of the virus. Oh, yeah, exactly. and you guys will be a lot more. You guys will be a lot more clearer in that sense. I'm, I'm guessing, you know. Yeah, because we don't have the possibilities oh. to take care of anything that would happen. That's the problem. It's that we only have the one hospital. We don't have that many like things to handle this kind of situation but also on Svalbard we have two Russian settlements so there's also you can go to Russia when you come here so if you go okay. from Longyearbyen which is where I live and you take a boat yeah. or snowmobile and you go to Badensburg you're in Russia and that's how far at like 60 kilometers okay yeah so, so when you go teaching, there you enter Russia you're teaching the tip of the high tip of Russia and then you just enter is that no, no, it's it on Svalbard. It's an like it's ah, a settlement on Svalbard, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they have a town. Also, Russia has a town on Svalbard, which is. It just sounds like a lot. House. It sounds a lot like Antarctica, which is kind of similar, where you've got you know where it's broken up to different countries and different. Uh, like UK has got a bit. Um, yeah. New Zealand has got a bit, and all the other countries as well. It's similar to that, really, isn't it? But yeah, well, you have thing. Russia that has one part, and then Norway ish yeah norway has this part and then also there's one more settlement called pyramiden which is the ghost town have you heard about it no do tell us oh, you, you need to do a google deep dive you love it so right, there's a whole town up here that's abandoned and it was russian it was it was supposed to be this amazing place that where they moved a bunch of uh, people from russia and they had this coal mine and they made it the most beautiful little village but then there was an incident and there was a plane crash and then uh, they left it. But everything is left as it was. So you can walk into the school and everything is still there. The books are on the tables. Like everything is just left as it was. And now they have a hotel there. And like four so people- How long are we talking? How, what do you mean? How long has it been empty? How long has it been a ghost town? About like 30 years maybe? Wow. Are the it's items so like pres preserved quite well? Because of the yeah, cold, because obviously. Like, the yeah, and then you have four people living there, I think in the winter and maybe 10 in the summer or something. And they keep this hotel running and they take care of guests and you can eat their Russian food. It's fascinating. It's amazing. It's beautiful. That but really it's is. Completely creepy. <laughs> yeah. You've got your best friend with you and yeah. you seem to be carrying a rifle of some sort. Yeah, a shotgun, <laughs> is, which shotgun. is what I wear. Yeah. There, so it's for polar bear protection only. I think people get this a little bit confused. I'm not a hunter. I don't have a hunting license. And I only wear it because we have to wear it. Because on Svalbard, we have polar bears that, I mean, they show up out of nowhere. I think there's on our island and the surrounding islands, there's about 3,000 bears. And they can be anywhere at any time. So when we go outside, there's certain points outside the village where you have to start carrying a gun. I live outside that point. So I need to carry a gun at all times when I go on walks and whenever I go outside pretty much. Because if you run into one, you need to be able to scare it off and worst case scenario, protect yourself. But there mm. is a huge fine if you shoot a bear, even if it's self-defense, because we shouldn't kind of be anywhere in a situation. That where, yeah, exactly. There should have been any, but of course it can happen. Like I said, we have a lot of bears going through this neighborhood, but then we need to be able to handle it where we don't shoot a bear. And I don't think we don't have that many cases where people have shot bears. It has happened, but 
It's not mm. that often. So I think you don't really hear it often as well. No. Um, there was one where there's there was this trip of boys that went from the UK. Oh yes. Uh, I think it was Norway. Yeah. I don't know if you heard about it where the, 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 I, was, I can't remember who was I think twelve or thirteen when they they have those defenses don't they the alarms trip but they wire. didn't go off. Yeah, yeah, Never they didn't go off and they attacked uh, the child, unfortunately, and that was a tragic event where they had to put the bear down. Yeah. It was um, really sad because it's actually one of my favorite animals, and I always tell my wife, it's like, if I ever come near a, te- near a teddy bear, near a polar bear, <laughs> so long as I get the shot, I don't care if it kills me. Obviously, I don't mean this literally. But I know what you mean, though. You want the shot. <laughs> you want the shot, but I also do love the animal so much. I don't know what it is. I just, I just find them so cuddly and so... They're probably not as welcoming as I want them to be. Uh, but then again, but there's not a lot on me that did. Yeah, but I promise you also that kind of feeling of wanting to take a photo, I thought that that was going to be my first instinct. But when those two little bears showed up, I was so just mesmerized that I didn't pick up any camera. I had like four yeah, on the just table. Get caught in the I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> so you kind of like your instincts kick in and cameras goes out the window and you just want to look at them so- because... It's so just talk about the rarity you're saying they don't often come up in your four years of being there. How many times have you actually come across them on your path? Never on my path walking, which is quite weird because it's just coincidence. I will have gone on my walk and then one hour later, there's a polar bear going through our village, you know, so it's just random luck. But when we've been out on our trips, we've we frequently see them because it, we're also like driving around on our snowmobiles miles and kilometers so we are we're covering a lot of ground so then we see a lot but i've never ever come into like a situation where i feel like i have to even pick up my gun because i'm gonna have to protect myself i've always been inside on a snowmobile or far away so when you're talking about these trips what what would you mean by the trips what are they are they tourist kind of trips that you do or is it no so We only have, like I said, our little village. So the only way to kind of get out of the village in the wintertime is by snowmobile. And that's what we all do. It's what we spend all of our weekends doing and every free time. Because outside of the village are all the glaciers and all the snow and all the mountains. So we have huge sleds, which we pack full of gear. I think our sleds weigh about 400 kilos that we pull after our snowmobiles. And then we go to different cabins. And the cabins can be super far away it can be like one of our crab cabin trips was six hours one way so we're driving to the east coast and then we stay there for a weekend and we just chill and stay inside the cabin and go on trips and then we drive home so that's kind of what our life up here is about for well many of us we just go out on cabin trips or snow what what how do you, you manage to fuel that all the way do you have like kind of bring everything or? yeah so you bring everything. Yeah, we bring, I mean, on that trip, we had 150 liters of petrol, I think, for two snowmobiles. Might have been wow. a bit more. Yeah, and then also there's no electricity or running water, so you have to bring water with you. You also yeah. have to bring wood with you because you have fire. to, uh, fi- yeah, for fire, and we don't have any wood up here, so all the wood gets transported from the mainland. <laughs> so we bring that with us. So the weirdest things are very expensive up here, like wood is super expensive because we don't have it. So we have the freight and everything. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we go out on uh, snowmobile trips to, you know, just see everything and to go take photos and check out glaciers. And there's so much to explore. It's that's, that's Going to, to Iceland. Iceland. Now I'm yeah. actually talking to somebody. I'm talking to somebody right now who is living a life that I could have want. or wanted to live, so to speak. And it's like, yeah. as much as I love you right now, I also hate you so much at the same time. But it's, it's amazing. It's, it's beautiful. How, what, what do you is, do for work? For work, I, sorry. Uh, how do you how do you get by in terms of work wise? What do you do for work? So when I came up here, I started working at a place called Huset, which was the best kind of starting job ever because it is the heart of the village. So I got to know many people, and I was there for like three years, I think, working with as a booking manager for a restaurant. But then I moved into kind of photography and I got my first drone. It's kind of funny because I I didn't even own a camera before I got my drone. I had no interest in photography. It was just, I didn't even think about it. And then I got my drone and my eyes were opened. (laughs) So I started my whole, yeah. Wait, this is very recent. Yeah, like two years ago. (laughs) When the first DJI Mavic came out. Yeah, I remember I I bought the same one when it came out. 
these images do look like you've got some extensive sort of like background easily but to say that you've done that in just uh, less time you really have got the eye for detail there credit where credit is <laughs> i don't know what definitely. it is but uh, yeah something because i didn't even have anything with photography to do before and then i got my drone i got super into it because i've always been kind of a nerd i play a lot of video games i love tech and then this was the perfect like perfect thing i could fly and see and start taking photos which i didn't even it's not why i bought it i wanted to play with it and then it just kind of evolved from there and i got my first camera and then i really got into it and i yeah it's crazy so now i work with uh, kind of videography and photography like freelance and i also yeah. work for the school that is up here what's very normal in svalbard is having many jobs or just doing a bit of everything because right, yeah. kind of just cover all your hours at different places That's right. i'm working at the school i'm working with photography i also worked in a clothing store for a while which i love because it forces me to put on normal clothes <laughs> otherwise i'll just be running around in you know pajamas or outdoor gear <laughs> so a bit you know of everything when it came to buying and getting a hold of the cameras, is it difficult to do that there? And it seems like a silly question, but do you have like a massive or some sort of camera store that has stuff? Because I wouldn't no. imagine you'd have something. We, we kind of have. People, so. Yeah. So what we have up here in like store wise is a lot of uh, outdoor gear. And then we have one, one supermarket uh, with very expensive food. And then we buy everything online. But what is good is that it's tax free. So we get everything tax free. So you're saying online, but where's it actually coming from? Norway. Not a lot of people ship here, but if you you can do like you can fool them and just put Norway on and hope that it gets here, and it's worked every time for me. But with my like expensive camera gear, I buy it from uh, Norwegian online shops, and they know what to do. So wow. we have like I'd say tech wise, we have a lot of options. Clothing wise, not many <laughs> to buy. Gear is very important, I'd say. It's very You know when, when when you're living in your cabin, how 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 is it like with heating and keeping it warm? Are you burning wood or do you have like what we have, which is central heat? Well, I don't think you'll have central heating. I don't I don't know how it works. How's it no, work over so there? our cabin we don't have any water. So we have to bring every water in. Like we don't have a shower and we don't have a normal toilet. So we have no running water. <laughs> this <laughs> so... is where you're living right now. <laughs> yes, in my house. We have no running water. Uh, so if I shower, is I it, go- is it, it's, not, it's not made of bricks, no, is it? It's literally a cabin made of wood. Yes, it's beautiful. I would show you, but it looks a little bit, mm, no. But, yeah, I know so, you said you've got builders coming in, so. Yeah, so we have no running water. So we bring all of the water in, in like kind of canisters and we have some systems to get it working. So when we do our dishes, we have kind of like a big boiling water thing that we can use and get the water out. Uh, but we realize it's too expensive to burn wood. So we put a AC in, an air conditioned unit that also yeah. is warm, like a heater in the winter, yeah. which has been working pretty good considering it's been minus 30. And we've had like icicles coming on the outside of, you know, the outside yeah, part yeah, of yeah. the, it's just been like, but it's worked. It gets really cold sometimes though. So we have to like double up, but. Where, where do you actually get your water from? You saying you bring it in, is that? You just uh, go outside my, and... Yeah, my boyfriend fills them at his work or we have to go to a friend's house. And also when we shower, we go to either a friend's house or like the, <laughs> the sports place. You get very comfortable with this life. And like, I'll be like a little long. That's person. okay. That's not frowned upon. That's, is that, is that I normal? Love it though. Like, I'm so surprised that after a year of living like this, I, I have no issues. I thought it was going to get annoying. And still, I'm like, anybody want to, you know, let me in for a shower? <laughs> you know, <I'm> like, <laughs> Fine. And I'll be there with my laundry basket, like twice, like every other week. Like, can I, can I go to your place? <laughs> Do some washing and whatnot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you get very sounds like a, it sounds like the perfect dream. <laughs> yeah. But it's kind of nice. It's like just knowing that you'll be fine with it. It's it's a good challenge. What other sort of wildlife do you get? I noticed you have uh, a few images of, you know, the is it is it the Arctic? I'm gonna guess it's the Arctic fox. The yeah. white one. Arctic fox or um, I think polar fox. 
either way. Are they, are they quite common or is it again, are they, are they a bit rare like the uh, polar bear? And do you just no, see them whenever? so many Arctic foxes. It's insane. Oh, wow. What's so funny though is apparently like many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, it was very rare to see an Arctic fox and now they're everywhere. So I'm not sure what's happening there, but we have them running around our house all the time. They're everywhere. So they're easy to see. You just have to go out and look for them because they're tiny. They're super small, and very fluffy, and very good at camouflage. We've got one over here. There, yeah, uh, there's, there's the one. Yeah, right outside our house, taunting Grim. Oh, was he? He's looking. He's like he's ready for the camera. He's he's ready for the shot. They're such posers. You'll see them just you know sit down in front of the lens, and they'll be like, <laughs> it's very funny. They're like so beautiful. Like, yeah. they're so cute. They're very cute. But they do eat like meat and dead reindeers, so they're little murder foxes. How, 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 um, how do I say? How sensitive do you think they are? Oh, I love that. <laughs> I don't know how you <laughs> manage to do that. A piece of cheese <laughs> dangling in front of him. He is the cutest. Are, they, are the foxes like? Can you approach them any closer if you want to take the shot? Or are they like the normal ones where they just see you and run away like straight away? I, I think they're posers. So you'll have like the ones that are used to people like out here where they literally come super close to you and just check out what you're doing because they're very curious. But it's good to have, I've realized it's good to have a like a long lens or like a 100 to 400 because you kind of always need that extra reach. Mm. Oh, just, just, to get that, just to get that image, yeah. That's inside yeah. It took us many hours to get here, and it was very hard to get here because we didn't really have... I can explain. So outside of the village, everything is just, you know, everyone's land. We can drive almost anywhere, but there's nowhere, like there's no roads, if you know what I mean. So you need GPS tracks, and either you have them yeah. yourselves, and the terrain changes every season. So every time you go to the same place, it's going to look different. And getting here mm. was very interesting because it took some tricky driving with our snowmobiles because we were going up and you know in water kind of on this like super thin ice but i mean it was very worth it it looks it's insane such an incredible cabin oh uh, um not a cabin uh what's it called Gl glacier cave it's oh, massive <laughs> i was flying my drone in there that was also very uh, that's interesting. Not what yeah. it surprisingly well it worked <laughs> yeah, because it needs GPS, out. doesn't it? Yeah, and I thought it was going to, you know, maybe not do well, but it did. This is also in the middle of the day during the polar nights, and it was snowing. And we are driving on ice here. Thick ice. This is open water now. Oh. Yeah, so that's also like oh. another thing. Many of our trips go over ice, but you also always need to be aware of, is this ice thick enough? So you need to bring yeah. drills and you need to check how thick the ice is and because it has to be to some thickness for safety doesn't yeah. it you like make a hole or something or drill yeah. and find out and it does happen yeah. often that people lose their snowmobiles because they've gone through the water maybe not like super often but it happens i know of many people who've lost snowmobiles in the water well through ice this is when this i did is... yeah we did a chinese documentary last year <laughs> i was in an oh, episode wow. Yeah, that aired in China. I think it had like 60 million views. It was insane. So they sent over uh, Lu Wen, which is one of the biggest supermodels. And she went right. on, uh, we went to pan for gold with her. Oh, wow. Very How was that experience? Incredible and insane. <laughs> it was very long days and it was just very special, but I loved it. It was very cool. She was such a trooper. She really just pulled through. We were doing quite yeah. like proper hikes. You're looking at um, walruses. Yeah. So we have they many. Seem frightening. How are they? How again? Are they so something that they, you just see them? They'll come by, or a lot of people. Look? A lot of people actually say that they are way more scared to meet a walrus than a polar bear because that's how aggressive yeah. they can be. It's so simply, I think it's just because the, the, the tusks seem to be quite big, and then you just imagine how, how much damage they can probably do. But And they're quite um, aggressive. They're like, they can you know, be when they're they in be So these two were laying on the ice outside the cabin we were staying in, and so I just sent my drone out, and I made sure they were. So they were close by. 
Yeah, super close by. They were just uh, outside maybe like 100 meters. So they're yeah. kind of so up. Not a lot here because we are, I don't know, they just don't really show up here a lot. But there are many places where they are. Sometimes they'll be in the village and it's just laying out on the beach or you kind of, it's kind of like everything. You'll run into it if you are out exploring. Oh, this Isn't is my that favorite. just a perfect selfie? My favorite glacier, the Fritschop Glacier. And again, that'll change every time because obviously the way the yeah the water behaves and the way the season is and everything else as well. Yeah. So that's you winter know. season. And the next time we came, we came back a couple of weeks later and we couldn't even go to the same place on the mountain because the snow had shifted. That's Tell me about this image. I find it's quite fascinating. I just loved how it's, how it's composed really well. You've got a solid ice on one side and then you've got, is that a glacier front that I'm looking at and it's fallen on the side? It's no, you're actually down. looking at where you have you have two houses there. So it's the cabin Correct. we were staying in, which is uh, ah. I don't know how it's two hours away from Longyearbyen on snowmobile. So you have the permanently frozen ground on the left side, and then you right. have all the ice which has broken apart on the right side. And also the big ah. flake of ice is actually ice toppled on top of each other. So it's like a pile of ah, ice okay. floating around in like perfectly squares, and it's super blue. It's crazy. Do you ever do fishing? Yeah, in the summer we fish Arctic cod. So soon, as soon as we have our boat in. Is that way you, you just, you, all right, so you actually go out to the waters, not one way. Um, I've seen it on some documentaries where they actually drill like the hole. Oh yeah, we do that as well. It's just that we don't have that many good waters to do the pimpel fisk. <laughs> what was it called? Is that what it's called? Yeah, so we do that. I've tried, but it didn't work very well. So it, it, how would you know where about the fish? You know, you've got, like I said, you've got this solid ice. How would you know where the fish might be? Well, you Especially have to check if, if it's solid team. and if it's permanently solid, that yeah. ice is going to be thick and hard to a certain extent. Yeah. Fish are going to have to be fairly deep underneath. Obviously, yeah. how do you know? There's no such fish detector, is there really? No, no, no. So you just have to drill a hole and then you have to sit there very patiently. That's why I don't do yeah. that much because you have to sit very patiently for a while. And so that kind of fishing, yeah, and then, but a lot of people do it and they get some fish, but you don't get that much. So it's more for the experience, I think. But fishing in the summer is amazing. I've caught a cod that was 12 kilos, which is Ooh. my biggest one I've caught. So it's huge. And it's I mean, dinner that's just for two right weeks. outside our house. So we take our boat and we go out here and that's a really good uh, fishing spot. So we would fish wow. actually for the restaurants, me and my boyfriend, that we could pull up like a hundred kilo of cod in a couple of hours. Just, you know, it's very fishing is, what, um, fishing is a trade that they had in Iceland at the time as well. Anyway, when it all started off and a bit of nowhere as well, but I think it's calmed down a bit now, hasn't it? Yeah. So I can assume that that's where all the freshwater fish would be. In, so I in think a, big, a big issue for us up here is that we don't have anything like any food that we can source ourselves. Well, we don't have that much. So I think mm. we always try to make sure to use the resources we have. So yeah. if we have fish, we want to go out and try to fish it because we get nothing mm. else that's fresh. We have reindeer, but very little. We get, if you're a hunter, you get one reindeer per year that you can hunt in a certain period at a certain place. Ah, so it's allowed. Yeah. You can only, so, you can only, you can only hunt one. That, that is it. Yeah, exactly. As a private like person with your own hunting license, you get one reindeer. But that reindeer, you also need to go and hunt in that area you're alloc like you're uh, you're allocated which can be far away. Oh. And then you also need to carry that reindeer home with you. So but, it's very like out in the nature, but I think it's the proper way to do it. Like you should do it the like proper way, if you know what I mean. You should go out there, yeah. if you're gonna shoot it, then it's you not... need to bring it back and- And then cook it and then exactly. store it. Exactly, and... all on your own, not, yeah. Not like what we've got here. We've got like a million apps that just allow you to order your food at your fingertips and it's all there <laughs> within 30 minutes, you know. Cooked, 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 no, everything's all done for you. You just eat it and throw it away and enjoy, and that's all it is. That's yeah. just how the, the stark difference between the life on one side of the planet and right exactly where you are. So tell me more about Svalbard. I mean, you, you did mention it's kind of open for tourists. Not not now, obviously, because of the border lockdowns, but once it opens, how, what can sort of people expect and what I think are your thoughts and views? Everybody really should try to come and visit Svalbard, but it's also very important to just choose your season because every season is going to give you something different. So if mm. you want to come for snowmobiling and seeing polar bears and, you know, the glaciers, 
you should come in the winter season, which is kind of February till May. And I think check out the website Visit Svalbard just to see when and what you want to do here, because that is really going to define your trip. But there's so much. I mean, if you want to see the northern lights, we have two and a half months with pretty much only northern lights. It's just wow. a very special place. I think there's so much to see here. And I think we really love getting our tourists and the visitors and showing off this island. It's just And beautiful. just to be clear, obviously, it's a lot more different in a different way to Iceland. It's got its own beauty, hasn't it? It's very different. I, I don't think you can compare the two because in Iceland, you can drive around. You have a whole different kind of tourism. You have the gazers and up here it's mm. about getting out of the village but only with what you can bring in a way you go on snowmobile trips and you go on boat trips it's a lot more barren and a lot more remote than i think you can imagine because it's literally there's nothing outside of the village yeah, you really do need a lot of sort of like adrenaline and the the really the need and the want to go out there yeah. I think so, yeah. If you're looking for a comfortable trip, this is not going to be your trip. I think you need to be able to come here and, you know, have kind of an urge to see something different and to mm -hmm. you know, push yourself a little mm -hmm. bit. And many of the trips are easy to go on. You can choose a nice, like, snowmobile trip that's just a couple of hours. But do try it because it's beautiful. So, yeah, so, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate thank that. Thank you so much for having me. This is so yeah, exciting. Thank you. So it's, thank you. it's great you that you're so inspired. Like you, you are somebody who's totally different, who's living the life <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. And, you know, you've, you've shown us how different it can be and how beautiful it can be. But you just need to have the, I think, your heart and mind really need to be set on that kind of environment. You know, it's yeah, not as easy definitely. like you just said. You need to be ready for it. And yeah, I think the hardest great. part, and, and this is going to sound really strange, the hardest part is maybe trying not to fall in love with it because you went <laughs> initially for three months and, you know, four and a half years later, you're still there. Definitely. Um, it's hard not to fall in love with, with beauty and nature. You know, it's mm -hmm. one of those things. It right. Really um, thank you, and we'll speak to you soon at some point. All the best. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>